What is repentance? Today, that is going to be our topic. We're going to talk about repentance. This is an important discussion because we have different definitions of what repentance really is. We have a Mormon definition. We have the Christian or biblical definition, and they just don't match. The Mormon Church published a manual called Gospel Principles, and in Gospel Principles, chapter 19, we have a chapter called Repentance. It lists seven essential steps that are required in order to jump through the hoops, jump through the steps of repentance, and be forgiven by God. Let's have a look. Step one is that we must recognize our sin. And I think it's good that we recognize that we are sinful. But I don't think it's possible that our, our fallen nature, our blinded eyes, can see every time we sin and recognize every incidence of sin. We, we go through life sometimes just not paying attention. And I think the sins that we commit are sins that we don't even see. You see, we cannot see ourselves as God sees us. So let's try to understand this. Imagine that you live a fully perfect life, except for one sin that you would call minor, insignificant, and, and so infrequent that it just doesn't matter. Imagine that you go through life believing that that one little sin won't matter in the end. Well, God sees it like this. If we turn to James 2.10, it says, For whoever keeps the whole law and yet offends on a single point, on one point, he is guilty of all of it. So this tiny, insignificant, doesn't matter sin that you see, God sees as being so significant that it is equivalent to breaking every law, every covenant, every commandment written in his code, in his law. Step two is that we must feel sorrow for our sins. Now, I, I think it's right that we do feel sorrow, but I think there's more. You see, God is love, but he also hates. Now, people say, oh, no, no, God is love. He doesn't hate. Well, I would beg to differ. Let's put it in terms that we can understand. Let's, let's look at it from our perspective that we would be comfortable with. You say, I love children. Therefore, you must hate child abuse. You must hate abortion. You might say, I love the Jews. Therefore, you must hate the Holocaust. You might say, I love my black friends and neighbors. Therefore, you must say, I hate slavery. Now, if we, being fallen and broken, have that kind of hate response to things that are truly dark and truly sinful, how much more would a holy God hate that which is sinful? Psalm 5.5 5, The foolish shall not stand in thy sight. Thou hatest all workers of iniquity. God does hate sin. It is right that we feel sorrow for our sins, but it seems better that we tremble because we are standing before a righteous God and his wrath is terrible and mighty and it destroys. So yes, I think it's important that we recognize our sin, but I think it is more important that we tremble in fear before a holy God. Because everything we do, remember, even if it's a single insignificant sin in our sight, it is enough to damn us to the full wrath and destruction of God. Step three, we must forsake our sins. You see, I believe that there are some who believe this is possible. I believe that they delude themselves. How can we forsake our sin? How can we, even as we've already discussed, when we can't recognize every incidence of sin, how can we forsake that? How, being broken and fallen and weak, can we forsake every sin? I believe that in pretending that we have forsaken our sins, 
I believe that we fail to recognize our desperate condition before a holy God. Every sin, large or small, is a direct assault against the glory of Almighty God. Every one of us are guilty, and we are not able to right ourselves, especially through works. Romans 3, 10 through 12 clears this up for us. It says, As it is written, There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are altogether become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. The Apostle Paul viewed the weakness of his own flesh this way. He said, For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing that I hate. Romans seven fifteen. Step four, we must confess our sins. I have no argument against this step if our confession is to God. In many occasions, it is also right that we confess our sins to the person that we sinned against. Gospel principles goes far beyond that. We must confess serious sins, such as adultery, fornication, homosexual relations, spouse or child abuse, and the sale or use of illegal drugs to the proper priesthood authority. To the proper priesthood authority, can we find support for that in the Bible? And so I would ask, if it is necessary that we confess our sins to men, is God so weak? that he requires the assistance of those men to forgive those sins that we would call more serious. John 1, 9 has the answer. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. All unrighteousness, God says. All unrighteousness. Not just minor sins, but all unrighteousness. God alone has the answer for us. He does not divide sin into major and minor offenses. All sin is rebellion. All sin is an assault against his glory. Any sin is equivalent to committing every sin, according to James 2.10. And God, in his own word, says that he alone has power to forgive every sin. The requirement to confess every Sin is interesting to me, especially the part that requires that we confess to men. You see, there was a period of my life where I kind of went off the rail, and I embraced all that is the peace, love, and dope culture of, of American hippies. I was, I was pitiful. I was broken. I was sinful. I did horrible things for a number of years. Then came the day that I had to examine myself and I found myself so in need of forgiveness. I prayed before God. I, I remember kneeling at my bed and weeping and begging God, please God, forgive me. I am so broken. I'm so messed up. I need you, God. And as I did this, I had an experience where God actually came to me. I felt his presence. I felt his love. I felt peace. And in that moment, I believe that I had forgiveness because I trusted only in God. But I also had the requirement of Mormon repentance. And so I made an appointment. I went and met with my bishop. And he heaped years, literally years of penance on me. Things that I had to do, perfection that I had to attain, performance that I must complete before I could be forgiven. And so did I receive forgiveness at my bedside that day? I'll leave that to you to answer for yourself. Listen to the rest of this video and make that judgment for yourself. Step five, we must make restitution. Now, yes, we can sin against brothers and sisters, and there are times when it is right that we correct that. But we have a problem. Sometimes we don't recognize our sins, as we have already established. But more importantly, all sin is an assault, an attack against the glory of God. What do we have 
What can we possibly do that would restore God's glory once we take it away? What can we do to make that right before a holy God? I say that there's nothing we can do. Mormonism's third article of faith says that in addition to the work that Christ did for us on the cross, all men will be saved by obedience to the laws and ordinances of the gospel. But Galatians 5.4 says something else. It says, Christ is become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. The law cannot save us. Hebrews tells us this over and over and over again. The law has no power to save. Is salvation really gained by a combination of our works and the contribution of Jesus? Paul knew better. Jesus is our all in all. He alone is enough. Any attempt to save ourselves by any combination of our effort and Jesus' contribution is a recipe for hell. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace ye are saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man can boast. You see, it is Jesus alone. We can't contribute. We have nothing to offer. Step six, we must forgive others. Finally, there is no argument there. The Bible is clear that we will be forgiven as we forgive. So we must give grace to those people around us. Step seven, we must keep the commandments of God. Which commandments? It says the commandments. All the commandments is the requirement under Mormonism. We must keep all the commandments. We have already established that we can't do that. You see, it's, it's, it's just nuts to assume that we can. Romans 3, 23 says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All of us. None of us are good. None of us are righteous. None of us can keep the whole law. The law is not a way to salvation, but a sure fire method for condemnation. We need grace. We need all the grace we can get. Sadly, Mormon doctrine continues to contradict the revealed word of God. Doctrine and Covenants 25.15 says this, Keep my commandments continually, and a crown of righteousness thou shalt receive. And except thou do this, where I am, you cannot come. You see, the requirement is perfect obedience to every commandment, and without it, where God is, we cannot come. Who can do that? So why is this all important? It is important because now we're going to contrast that with what God has said, what God says repentance is. You see, the word repentance, the word repent, actually has a definition. So let's start there and see what it meant in the original languages, in, in the Hebrew and in the Greek. In Hebrew, it is nakam. I don't know if I pronounced that right. It's kind of a guttural thing, nakam. Uh, and, and the Hebrew says, according to Strong's Concordance, that to repent is to make a strong turning to a new course of action. So it is simply to turn from this to that or turn from this to that. It is a change of direction. The Hebrew is clear. It is simply to turn. Now in the Greek, the word for repent is metanoia. Metanoia also has the definition in Strong's, and it is to change your mind. Now, I think that it's very interesting. Hebrew says to turn. Metanoia says to change your mind. Well, I think that they go hand in hand because until we decide in our mind that we're going to turn, we can't turn. And so the, the Hebrew to turn and the Greek to change our mind, they go hand in glove. They are united in their meaning. And so when we consider the Hebrew and Greek together, we see a common thread. It is a change of mind, of direction, of purpose and focus. We see no indication of forsaking all sin and keeping every commandment. We see nothing in the, in, in the original languages 
that has anything even, even close to the Mormon seven steps. They're just not found in the Bible. Did God repent? In Exodus 32, we find an interesting story. The Lord was angry at the people of Israel because of their sin. And because he is holy, because he is righteous, justice had to be served and his wrath had to be poured out on those people. But God is also love. And under certain circumstances, he will extend grace to his people, even though they deserve death. In this case, Moses poured out his heart in prayer for the people, and God gave mercy and extended grace. In this, Moses is a picture, a shadow of Jesus who was to come, because Jesus also is the go-between for us that we might receive mercy and grace. In Exodus 32, 14, we read, And the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto the people. Now, did God sin so he had need for repentance? Did God sin so he had a need for the seven steps of Mormon repentance? Of course not. God doesn't sin. God can't sin. But God can turn from his wrath if certain conditions are met. God can turn away from his vengeance and give mercy and grace if certain conditions are met. And that's what we see here in Exodus. God repented. He turned away. He changed his mind because certain conditions were met. In this example, we clearly see that repentance is not the cessation of sin but it is to change our mind or change our direction, turning to a new course. God did not sin and therefore had no need of the Mormon version of repentance. And so while we are deserving of wrath, God gives mercy. This is explained in Romans 5, 8. It says, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. What then must we do to be forgiven? Jesus was asked by the people, what do we need to do to be doing the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God that ye believe in him who he sent. This is John 6, 29. The answer is that we believe. We believe in him who the Father sent. We believe in Jesus Christ. You see, when we repent biblically, we simply turn toward Jesus. And as we turn to Jesus, we find that there's no need for the seven steps. As we turn to Jesus, by default, we turn away from everything else. As we focus on Jesus, we quit seeing everything else. As we think of Jesus, we quit thinking about everything else. As we rely and trust and surrender to Jesus, we quit leaning on everything else. That is all that is necessary. And so to repent is always a turning. We can turn to the seven steps of Mormonism, and in that, we find the need to work our way out of our sin. We find a need through our own strength to overcome our sin. We find a need to perfectly live the commandments. But we find that that's very difficult. And the other thing we do is when we turn to the Mormon seven steps, we are saying Jesus alone isn't enough. Jesus is too weak and his sacrificial blood on the cross is too thin and too watered down to forgive us. And so he needs our help. In doing this, we stop believing in the one God sent and we stop doing the work of God. But when we repent biblically, we turn our vision, our direction, our love, and our devotion toward Jesus alone. And we become new. 1 Corinthians 5.17 tells us, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And this is when we can finally rest 
in the promise of God. Romans 8, 1 tells us. There is therefore no condemnation in them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So my friends, I ask you, which of the two examples of repentance is possible? Are the seven steps of Mormonism possible? Can you recognize all your sin? Can you turn away from all your sin? Can you, can you keep every commandment? Or does it make more sense to follow the biblical example, to simply believe in he who the Father sent, to trust in him, to turn away from everything else because we turn to him, to focus on him so we don't focus on everything else, to trust in him so we don't trust in anything else. Which one can we do? And which one is in fact impossible?